If you go beyond three or four years in prison here, you'll be lucky if you get out alive because either you'll get ill, you'll crack mentally, or you're just gonna end up dead anyway because it's so, so dangerous. When I was there, because you're in it and you're in this situation and there's a daily occurrence, people getting shot, dismembered, yeah. and burned, or, I mean, every form of killing that you can think of, hung, drowned, poisoned, I mean, everything. I mean, I've, I've, I stopped counting the number of people that, I've, that I know that have either been killed or died. It's just yeah. it's way over 100. And this is like almost daily, so, you know, in the back of your mind, I, Every day you're thinking, is it going to be me tomorrow or today? And on December 28th, he was shot dead, taken out by a Colombian uh, hitman on behalf of one of the other gangs, or there was some talk of a Mexican cartel being involved. People don't believe you, they go, that can't be true. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't happen, you were in prison. People don't have guns, machetes, explosives. And this is the problem, in, in, like I said before, in, the, in these prisons, there's no escape. If you end up in trouble like he did, there's nowhere to go, there's nowhere to run. You can't go to the director, you can't go to the guards, you can't go to your embassy. And just the fact that I wasn't gonna get killed or end up dead was just nice. Wow, this has got to be some of the craziest, most dangerous shit <laughs> I've ever heard in my life. I'm speechless. I've just watched videos. <sighs> I told Pete that I'm not a morning person. I was a bit sleepy. <laughs> and he showed me videos of what's just happened in the prison where he's at. I was and in. <laughs> in the first five minutes of YouTube, you're not supposed to get too graphic. So how can I phrase this? Heads getting cut off, beating hearts in people's hands. Dismembered and bodies. Dismembered bodies. And these were people you knew. Two of my friends have been beheaded. Two of the guys I was on the same wing as. Uh, one whose name is Marino. So R.I.P. Marino. Uh, was, yeah, beheaded uh, in Ecuador. Sorry, in Ecuador Sounds in the prison. Uh, on Tuesday, that was the 23rd of, what were we on? January, uh, February. <laughs> yep. In the prison riots that have just happened in Ecuador, big, big, big riots in four of the prisons in, well, in the prison that I was in, in Guayaquil, in Cuenca, Turi, Cuenca, um, Latacunga, and, and one other, 80 dead in total. And it's ongoing. Uh, struggle for control of the prison uh, between rival gangs, the Choneros, Los Lobos, uh, and a few others I've forgotten the names of. And in these videos, they were saying um, one was a snitch that they just massacred. I'm sure quite a few infor yeah, police informants that were in the prison got taken out in this r most recent massacre. So sure. do they house the police informants in separate areas? No. And then when there's a riot, they get into that area. Is that how it works? No. In the, the, the prison in Ecuador, I mean, it, I know you did time in the States. Yeah. And it was like, there, I'm sure, informants and whatnot will be on a separate wing, as in Britain, they're on the numbers or, or the rule. Well, I can't remember what it, rule 34 is it. The numbers they call the it numbers in this country, in England, yeah. anyway. Uh, you know, with the sex offenders and all the rest of the people that shouldn't be on the main population or in the main population. Whereas in Ecuador, it's all kind of mixed in and mishmashed together, including sex offenders. Yeah, including sex offenders. Sometimes they would get singled out, but normally they get killed. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, generally it's all sort of mixed mashed in together. It was quite weird for me because having been in prison in England and having that them and us uh, sort of mentality to then seeing rapists yeah, on the wing with us who, you know, had done pretty awful things. But then when it kicks off into a right situation, they clean house. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I've never seen anything quite like that before in my life. It's like a butcher's shop on a, on a Friday. It was, <laughs> not it? Wasn't it? I mean, we can't even show this stuff. It would shut a YouTube channel down. This stuff is yeah. so horrific. It was like watching Saw movie. 
Yeah, but for real. Yeah. What Horrendous. Did you, what did you guys think of it? It Thank was you. disturbing, isn't it? Yeah. To say the least. My goodness. All right, so, <gasps> welcome to Peter. <laughs> and he has a book out, which is really harrowing, not just from the graphic stuff of the gangs, but also I was just horrified by the lack of medical treatment, the medical treatment that Peter still, you know, the medical condition Peter still suffers to this day yeah. as a consequence of what he went through. And in some of these prisons, if you can't, if you don't have money, you don't get treated. That's why like charities like Prisoners Abroad yeah, do really good work. A little bit. They pay for people to have medicine that they just wouldn't get and they would die if they're a UK citizen overseas. That's who they support. So please support Prisoners Abroad and the Curse yep. Trust. They're great people. Definitely. Um, so chronologically then, we were going through your story. Yeah. Oh, um, Peter's links will be in the description box as well. His Vice videos got three plus million views. And you, do you like people to contact you through Facebook or anything like that? Yeah, they can do. Yeah. Okay, we'll put Go all ahead. that down there. And, and the link for the book on Amazon as well. It's, it's absolutely brilliant read. Thanks. I left a five-star review for it on Amazon. Did you? Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, last time we left off, right? You, you you took us through your entire journey, most of it, of how you got into this <laughs> cocaine business, in and out of prison in the UK. Started out as a party person, but then you made some quite heavy contacts, and you actually made news headlines in the UK. Just to recap, yeah. There was a, a lab, wasn't there, up in Scotland? What was that about? Uh, yeah, the, the lab got taken out in Edinburgh with a couple of Colombians in there uh, who were extracting, well, allegedly extracting cocaine from uh, a tent uh, that, that we had allegedly brought into the country. Um, the, well, where did I finish off last time? Finished off last time, there was like a riot situation. There was like a war for... Well, I mean, yeah, that was that was the gunfight. The in, gunfight in Ecuador. Yeah, Shall I finish with that. Yeah, what let's keep going with that. All right. So yeah, when, when we last finished off here, uh, I was talking about a gunfight that had happened on my wing uh, between the the gang, the Chorneros, and the Cubanas, who were the two main gangs in the prison at the time, rival gangs, and they were trying to get to the boss of the Chorneros, who was called uh, JL or Hotter Ellie, Jose Luis Zambrano. And on December 28th of the year just gone, they managed, well, he was released uh, a few, couple of months prior to that. And on December 28th, he was shot dead in a cafe in the port city of Manta in Ecuador, taken out by a Colombian uh, hitman on behalf of one of the other gangs or there was some talk of a Mexican cartel being involved but I think that was just a supposition so he was executed basically uh, the video of which we have here which we will not be showing no uh, <laughs> sad news because I knew him he was, he was quite a decent guy dangerous but decent <laughs> uh, I'm in regular contact with his brother Carlos still to this day I spoke to him yesterday um, and as, as as a consequence of him being killed, uh, there's now a power struggle in the prisons, uh, which has brought about this massacre that we were talking about just now. <sighs> so James <laughs> said he was going to put some of this stuff on his channel for you. Yeah. James, all oh, right. What's your channel called, James? Oh, underground film. <laughs> I underground think it would films. have to be underground. <laughs> I'm being sarcastic, of course, but this is an opportunity to plug James's channel at this point, Underground <laughs> Films. The link will be in the description box. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, keep going. Okay. Uh, yes, yeah, so there was the the gunfight. Uh, I, th I think I gave a description of it last time, didn't I? Yeah, but if you want to recap. As, as well, a couple of people were shot dead. Uh yeah, I remember I was talking about it. And we were made to stand in all the blood and all the rest of it. Yeah. Which is pretty gory. And how's um, that? How is that standing in blood? Uh, were you both nice. up? No, I wasn't actually. I'd put on a pair of trainers which were ruined after that. Yeah, they were soaked about that far up the train in, in the guy's blood. <laughs> Obviously, who I knew. Wow. And it was, yeah, the width of a prison cell. So, from what, about my arm's width, I suppose. Yeah. English prison cell. Yeah. Half of that area uh, entirely um, saturated in his oh. blood. Well, about that deep. 
I mean, he bled, he's bled out. He's a big guy. Oh. There was a lot of blood. <laughs> 130 of us herded into the, and then cat and nine tailed coming out by the police. As a lesson. Are you okay psychologically after seeing all this stuff <laughs> firsthand? Because you just showed us, us on camera. And I don't yeah. feel okay My after watching this stuff on bit. camera. My stomach <laughs> is still funny right now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how you were living with these people day in, day out. You yeah. were very close to some of these gang leaders, like yeah. bonding with them. They were protecting you at one point, And then all of a sudden, you're seeing them get murdered in horrible detail. I mean, how, how do you deal with that psychologically? It's, it's difficult. I mean, when I was there, because you were in it and you're in this situation and it's a daily occurrence, people getting shot, dismembered, yeah. and burned. I mean, every form of killing that you can think of, hung, drowned, poisoned. I mean, everything. So you've seen every, every form everything. of killing imaginable in well, front of your eyes. Yeah, yeah, virtually everything. I don't think there's many people been on this podcast who've, who've had that experience, you know. Yeah, it's not nice. I mean, I've, I've, I stopped counting the number of people that, I've, that I know that have either been killed or died. It's just yeah. it's way over 100. You've seen over 100 people. Way over. That has got to be a record on this podcast. And that is by virtue of the environment, isn't it? Yeah. E I mean, you know, it, it, prison. the murder rate in there was between five and six a week. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, you know, that's nearly one a day. So there's two things then. There's the psychological burying of that to adapt to the situation because it's yeah. raw survival mode for you you're yeah. thinking shit that could happen to me how do i avoid it so you're not really thinking i feel sorry for that guy until later on when it's like you're free and you're probably wondering like yeah. Yeah. they were my mates i had to bury that at the time just to get through it but now i think fucking i've got some trauma here that i might need yeah some, some i mean counseling or something yeah i was i was diagnosed with complex ptsd which is uh the complex part signifies where you're in an enclosed environment or an environment which you can't escape from and it's repeated trauma ongoing. Yeah. And you imagine Torture. I was there over nine years and this is like almost daily. So, you know, in the back of your mind, every day you're thinking, is it going to be me tomorrow or today? You know, you just don't know what's going to happen because it can flash like that. Yeah. Suddenly, you know, you might get caught in the crossfire. Someone might just take umbrage with you or not like you for whatever reason and pull yeah. a knife. You know, just so many ways to die there and very quickly. Yeah. Very quickly. Oh, wow. All right. Yeah. I'm, I've got loads of questions about that, but let, let's keep going with the story for now. <laughs> uh, yeah. So after that shootout, um, they took most of the, the, the Choneros because there was about 20 or 30 of them on the wing that I was on. They took them out and put them on a, a wing, especially for them. So they could have their own wing basically out of the area that was controlled by this other gang, the Cubanos. And because I'd become very close to these guys, uh, this hotel, is JL and his brother Carlos and that group, because they were kind of better guys. The other gang, the Cubanos, were kind of more street level criminals like robbers, thieves, rapists, you know, all that sort of stuff. Whereas these guys were more educated and just generally easier to get, easier to get on with. Sorry. Um, and he'd actually put me in charge of dealing the coke on the wing as well. So you, you can see that, that I was quite, you know, quite in with them. And obviously the other gang were aware of this and didn't like the fact that I was like that with them. And the only thing that saved me was the fact I was a foreigner. And the day after this shooting had happened, this, this gun battle, because uh, it happened at 9.30 at night, uh, in October of, I can't remember when, 2008, nine, something like that. The next day, the the gang that was then controlling the wing, the, uh, the Cubanos locked everybody in their cells and said, you can't come out. And they went cell by cell, dragging out anyone they didn't want in the wing, anyone that was vaguely connected to the, the Choneros, beating them, torturing them, just taking all their stuff off them, and then fucking them off out of the wing, basically. And I could hear them going round, getting closer and closer to myself. Bang, 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 bang. And I'm going, oh, God, I know it's coming. Oh, my God. I know it's coming. You know. 
I'd be surprised when the shooting was going on that I didn't actually get shot because the things bounced, bullets bouncing off my door, impacting the door and stuff like that. And I was thinking, you know, that they're either trying to get in or I'm, you know, I could be on the list. Luckily for me, my visitor who had permission to come in, you know, most any day because she was part of the church out there, a woman called Mercedes, turned up that day to see, obviously, to see if I was okay because it had been on the news, turned up literally about three cells before they reached my... That's like guardian angel. Right yeah, there. she was my guardian angel. So she's, she's now in my cell and the door shut. They bang on the door and I think, oh, this is it, I'm done. I opened the door and I said, look, I'm, I'm with my visit because visits there were like sacrosanct. And they sort of looked around me, looked at each other and went, wait a minute. <laughs> Closed the door, went off. I obviously had a bit of a conflab. Came back, banged on the door again. There's about 20 or 30 of them there, all like raring to get in the cell. <laughs> Knives and guns out. <laughs> and uh, Mercedes is like, you're not coming in. You're not coming in. And they said, okay, you're a foreigner. We'll leave it for now. But it didn't stop there. Wow. This has got to be some of the craziest, most dangerous <laughs> shit I've ever heard in my life. So we've had some stories on this channel, <laughs> but I mean, I just seen this this morning. Heads yeah. getting cut off, hearts. This is what got happens, and they were coming for him. Yeah, they were coming for three me. doors away. <laughs> I mean, Peter, generally, I don't talk about these things outside of things like interviews yeah. because people don't believe you. They go, "That can't be true." Yeah, yeah. That doesn't happen. You were in prison. People don't have guns, machetes, explosives, phones. You're in a prison that, that doesn't happen, but I'm afraid, yes, it does in South America. And if you want, if you, if you want to question me, just check the news, recent news, BBC, and, and shout around out, the world. Shout out to Natalie Welch as well, because when yeah. she arrived in her prison in Venezuela, Bennett, same thing. She saw the armed men on the roof and thought they were the guards. <laughs> they were the gang members. Well, which are kind of guards <laughs> to a certain extent. <laughs> And we've done her audiobook as well, and her paperback, and her ebook. It's all republished on the Natalie Welch Escape from Venezuela's Deadliest Prison. I'll have to try and remember, put all these links in the description box. How's she? Oh, she's doing really good. Yeah. She lives overseas now. She knows some of my friends because I'm from near Gloucester. She's uh, yeah. got mutual friends. Yeah. So, yeah. big shout out to Guy Rumble. Cool. So, I'm sure we'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> all right. The three doors away. Guardian Angel just fucking materializes. Yeah, yeah. But it's not over. 30 dudes, machetes gone. Yeah. We're coming. So, you. you know, have my visit and I'm just praying that Mercedes won't leave, to be honest. Oh, oh my God. God I can't, I you must have wet in your pants at that <laughs> I was visit. I'm pretty worried. I mean, this isn't a normal visit that year. It was just her on the wing. Yeah. She was the only visit that had come in. Yeah. So it was, it was literally a Guardian Angel time. So she leaves and uh, obviously they've gone on and smashing other doors and. Hold on, hold on, people. slow down, slow down. As she's leaving, what is going through your head as you're realizing the I'm visit? I'm just praying she wouldn't leave. The visit, you realize <laughs> I cannot keep this visit going anymore. Yeah, it's my life going through your head? <laughs> oh, well, I just what can I do? I mean, that 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 was the that was the thing in there. What there was no there was no escape. Um, Did you in, pull every trick out your sleeve to keep it going? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but leave. <laughs> and then it comes to the point where she's got to go. Yeah. Now you're thinking, right? I can't, I'm dragging on the <laughs> 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 coattails. Don't go. <laughs> How? What's the procedure now to get from the visit room to? Oh, there's you... no, there's no visit room. Oh, that's on the wing. That's what I mean. She oh, was it's on the yeah, wing. Yeah, she was in my cell. She's in your cell. That's what's saving. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you got a female in there with a foreigner, the thirty gang members. Yeah. They've looked in and said what? Is it well? Just seen her. Yeah. And said, oh, you know. I've said, look, I've got a visit. <laughs> They're hoping that would save me. And no, did, is that because they have like a respect for women and yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah, it's very respectful of females, women, um, and also just the visits are very sacrosanct. So the minute she leaves, then are you like peeping your head out? Well, got, no, like, got one of those little all the, all the doors were still no, 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 because it was it wasn't in the, that particular prison. The doors were solid wood, yeah, or metal. Thankfully, because that's what stopped the bullets coming through. Yeah. Um. So the door stays shut now because obviously they, they, they're still going cell to cell. And they finish and I'm, and I'm sat there thinking, please don't come back. Please have forgotten. And 
time goes by and so there's a, a much lighter knock at the door. Obviously, I'm listening out for footsteps. How, how much longer, <laughs> how much time has passed when this new knock comes? It's probably in the evening now. In the evening. Like six, seven, something like that. Okay. And this other guy from their gang, the Cubanos, comes to the door. He's quite, he was quite friendly with me anyway. Yeah. Because I, 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 obviously, I had friends on both sides. Yeah. Because I've been there years and I was a foreigner, they sort of saw me as not really being either or the other. But because I had been involved with the John Eras and selling drugs for them and become quite tight with them, and there were a couple of them just didn't like foreigners. So that was trouble. So you've got some friendlies in the Cubanas. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And quite high up as well. So Okay. So anyway, one one of them comes to the cell and he knocks on the door. He says, look, I think you'll be right. You know, uh, you might just have to smooth it over a bit. So... I don't know if it was that night or a couple of nights after. I've got I get taken to the new boss's cell. He was this skinny guy. I think there were three of them. Normally it was one gang member would be like the boss of each wing, and then he'd have his underlings, like boss of the drugs, a boss of the alcohol, or the boss of this that, and the other. So they take me to one of their cells. Hold on a minute. You just said the guy said, "I think you're going to be all right." So yeah. people are being butchered, macheted. <laughs> And shot. Well, no, shot. They shot. all shot this time. <laughs> and you're being told by a gang member, I think you're going to be all right. You <laughs> might just have to smooth things over with us. Come on now. <laughs> yeah, come along. <laughs> what? Come what? on, Peter. <laughs> is that a bit like, in your head, is that a bit like, how the fuck am I going to get through this? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> very much. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you say it in a very calm voice and you're smiling. Yeah, I wasn't smiling. <laughs> I mean, this is part of the reason I got through it is because you see how I am. You yeah, know, I, I can adapt to nearly any situation with any type of person. So did did you just keep very mild mannered then? Yeah, yeah. To these people? You have to be very humble, very mild mannered. It's just like yeah, yeah, yeah. So they take me to his cell. I walk in the door. Yeah. And this other guy who I was quite friendly with on on their team, <laughs> should we say, <laughs> called Armando, who was in there for killing three police officers quite a big guy pretty strong as i walk in the door armando stood behind the door and i didn't see him so the door slammed shut behind me <gasps> and armando's there i know when armando's there you might not be going out of the cell because <laughs> armando is used to choke hold people and then drown them <laughs> that's his job you've seen this guy execute people oh yeah <sighs> he's quite friendly <laughs> this is just getting crazy and crazy man you're in the door closes, there's the executioner who you've yeah. seen. Literally. I said, Hi, Armando. How are you? <laughs> I guess that's all you can do. You're powerless, aren't you? Yeah. And, Completely um, powerless. This new boss who I called the maggot because he was thin and he looked like a worm. So uh, I called him El Gusano, which is maggot or worm in Spanish. That was his nickname. No, well, that's what I called him. When, they, I, when a couple when of them found out, they when... said, Don't let him know that because he will kill you. <laughs> So anyway, the worm, uh, El Gusano, uh, starts, because, you know, he's, he's, I can see he's been drinking, which is always a bad, you know, you know, it's just not good. And probably doing coke as well, which is, it makes it even worse. So he, I come in and there's a couple of them in there and Armando got now behind me and the door shut. And uh, he looks, he's, you know, he's sort of half sat against the table and he started a drink and he sort of looks at me like this out of the corner of his eye looks back takes a drink looks at me again and starts just saying look we know you were tight with these other guys and this and the other but we we've decided to, to forgive you oh my god when, you, when but, they said that what was going through your head but only only if you oh, I think they asked for money I'm pretty sure they did I'm trying to remember because I mean so much has happened in nine years it's you're a western you're a piggy yeah. bank it's the, just, the yeah, shit exactly. they want they're shaking you down pounds or, well dollar yeah, signs in this yeah. case yeah so it's like oh you know you're going to have to pay a fine a multa you know fine mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of expected it That that was the best thing that was the, that best, was the best case best scenario. Option. Yeah, exactly. Buy your way out. <laughs> so I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't know whether I'm, you know, I try, try and be clever. Played hard to get. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just for a laugh. Oh, well. So, and then he turns around and he says, oh, look, 
I, I could have you killed right now. I said, well, go on then. And I tell you what, I wish I fucking hadn't. Oh, my God. <laughs> because cause he was half sort of joking with me p- before, before I said that. And then I called him out. And, of course, he had his friends and he'd been drinking. And as soon as I said it, I thought, you stupid idiot. Why the fuck did you say that? It was going so well yeah. until you said that. <laughs> the deal was in the fuck. <laughs> And uh, yeah, his demeanor changed. <laughs> Can you describe that? Well, he just his mouth just went down instead of up. <laughs> it's like turn a smile upside down; it's a frown. It's not the other way around here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, he's frowning, <laughs> and um, he uh, he turns to Armando and says, "Armando, go and get the other guys." And then I start going, "Whoa, well, I was only joking." And he said, well, it's too late. You've said it now. <laughs> I was oh like, God. oh, fuck. I was, I was like, I said, I, and then I started apologizing. I was like, I'm really sorry. I didn't. <laughs> but I was starting to get worried. <laughs> so. How was your bladder at this point? It was, it was getting weak. <laughs> no drips. <laughs> no, not that bad. <laughs> so Armando comes back after about 10 minutes of me sweating in there. Maybe not 10 minutes, actually, probably about two or three. <laughs> With the rest of the team, with a few more guys, uh, who you've probably seen. And I, I saw there was a bucket, you know, like a tub of water, you know, ready where they've obviously been, you know, waterboarding other people. And uh, they come in and start going, you know, and uh, yeah, basically he turns to me. I think it was actually Armando or someone else spoke over me and said, "Oh, you know, give him a pass." Really. But it's going to cost you. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> Are you not making jokes anymore at this point? No. <laughs> no, the jokes have stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Joke time was finished. <laughs> Happy hours cancelled. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so how how did you manage to <clears throat> get out of that <clears throat> meeting? Let's say. <clears throat> God. Um, yeah, I, I think I agreed to pay a, a fine, which, uh, I did in the, in the, in the days after, I think, as I remember, I said, it was about a grand, I think I ended up paying. So that was a one-off payment. Did you have to give them a monthly stipend to hold well, them Well, this is bay? the problem after is they, all the people that they didn't like, they started taxing and they would then, they, they, for everybody on the wing, I th- I'm just trying to remember exactly what they did. But I think it was they set a weekly, uh, like, uh, honor repayment to the gang of about twenty dollars per person per week. Per week, and this is a very it's poor country. Were they all country. foreigners or were this locals? No, this is uh, all locals, mainly locals. That's a lot. There's about it, five though? or six foreigners on the wing. That's, that's a big, it. Big tax on the locals. About 130 people. So, yeah, maybe te- eight or ten foreigners mm. max. <clears throat> um, so yeah, twenty dollars like on a repayment, ten dollars for food, as well, and then any other schemes that they might cook up for things like painting the the wing. Obviously, they got the paint for free from the government, but they would charge everybody twenty dollars for that as well. So every week they would come up with a, a new project, plus all these other payments. I mean, they were bankrupting everybody as much as they could, and. It, Oh, anyone they didn't like as well. They'd pick one or two people every week on a Saturday or Sunday. They'd just go around, they'd strip the cell and throw them off the wing to take everything off them. And did they have the power to keep doing that or did that foment oh, yeah, a rebellion? Cause it, no, because, I mean, they, they, you know, they were the main gang then. The, this other gang that were a lot better, the Chonneros, they, they'd been uh, ejected to another wing of their own. I kind of wish I went with them, to be honest, because I'd have been set. Mm. But I stayed behind, did it the hard way, and uh, this went on for a few months and I got sick of it and uh, they sort of started making it, it, it basically the wing was uh, a long thin wing like this two stories but the, the, the bottom story was where I was and it was that was one wing separated from the upper which was a separate wing but the upper one started to become a wing just for foreigners so I had a good English friend up there and I decided in the end to, to move up there, but I had to do it really cleverly. Gradually started passing my things up, you know, as slyly as I could. And then on 
I think on a visit day, I managed to pay the heavy the gear, the head guard, two hundred dollars to come and get me with some backup from upstairs from another part of the same gang, but a friendlier part. <laughs> From a guy called Media Vaca, which is half cow, and he looked like a cow, and he was big and fat. <laughs> half cow came and got me. <laughs> With the heavy new gear, the guy head guard. Oh, who was called Angel Eyes because he'd killed that many inmates. This black guy with the eyes like death. Literally called Angel Eyes. This is like Cloud Cuckoo Land meets <laughs> yeah. mass murder. <laughs> it's just insanity, I know. So I managed to get upstairs. But they, they, yeah, they didn't like it because they saw me as cash cow and they saw their cash cow disappearing quite quickly out the door, running. <laughs> <laughs> Mooing as he went. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So then I moved to upstairs, which uh, was called Atenuado Alto, uh, which is actually the same wing as my friend who's just been beheaded, Marino. That was the same wing. So that was goodbye to downstairs. Never to return. <laughs> Never to return. And on a happier note, El Gusano is now dead. The maggot. <laughs> the, what happened to the maggot? <clears throat> he got released from prison and he pissed off that many people that um, he was traveling down a, uh, a road somewhere in Ecuador at high speed on a, on a, on a motorbike or scooter or whatever and someone pulled a garrote wire across it and peeled his head back. I'll tell you what, when they phoned me up and told me they'd done it, I was so happy. I was ecstatic. <laughs> to say the least, so. Farewell, they don't, farewell, Gusano. They do all these homicides in style, don't they? Yeah, they're pretty inventive. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Where there's a will, there's a way. So <laughs> you've moved to this other wing now, and do you feel safe with these with the foreigners? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not all foreigners. The, I mean, there's still the, the Cubanas are still running that wing as well, but they're a lot more laid back and I know most of them up there anyway and also I knew from my previous experience in Quito where I'd had our little uh, Euro band of the foreign gang that I set up I knew that if we had numbers we were a little bit pro better protected because we could get armaments possibly and whatnot. but at least we stood half a fighting chance you know did the foreigners then, were they pretty hardcore or did you have to do some hand-holding? I mean, like a new foreigner coming in, for example, suddenly sees people getting murdered. No, most new foreigners, when they came in, we would get hold of them because they, they started being brought to our wing after that. So we would get them and say, look, you know, just give them an easy landing, basically. And when you explain to them what actually happens in there, were they, like, incredulous? Generally, yeah. <laughs> and do they perhaps think that you were make, making up things and, yeah and i they think would until, see they, the until they saw a gun or, or or something in someone's hand and then they'd realize that you weren't joking and it was real and did they change did it change like the the way they behaved after that when they realized it was real yeah yeah i mean i remember on several occasions you know maybe someone who coming in they'd be a little bit more cocky than someone else and they think you know with the western sort of mentality that they would think oh you know we're a bit high and mighty and this is a third world and I could take the piss and I've got money so I can do what I want. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not here. It's the opposite way around. You're the minority. Did you see anyone like that push it so far that they brought the consequences upon themselves? My best friend got killed there, Steve. Do you want to yeah. give, us, give us Steve's backstory and say what happened? Yeah. Um, just... Just to say his out of respect because he's got two daughters. Why well, I think he may have a few more. And one of them contacted me just a couple of days ago, asking for more information because after he was murdered, the embassy kind of covered it up a bit. I've explained to them a bit more what happened, but you know, in case there's anything new that I haven't explained, then you know, sorry, but I am. Well, I expect I will have contacted you by the time you might see this. So. Steve had been in prison nearly, well, he'd, he'd been arrested prior to me, so he'd been there a bit longer, uh, had done uh, about the same time as me, nine years when he got killed. So it's he, the old drugs charge, is it then? Yeah, he was actually arrested without any drugs at all, but uh, they, or he and his group had been shipping coke into um, the docks at Avonmouth in Bristol. Uh, welded into the digger arms of JCBs and uh, oh. big machinery. It was like three or four hundred kilos Agreed. that he was up for. 
So he's got a conspir- conspiracy charge. Yeah. I ended up getting sentenced to the maximum 25 years, which is what they tried to give me. Uh, he had lost hundreds of thousands of dollars through corrupt lawyers that had stolen the money from him. Other people, other inmates who had said they could help with lawyers who had just stolen the money from him. Uh, he'd lived in Spain for years. And uh, yeah. So towards the end of his sentence, he starts trying to do business because he's desperate for money to get out. He's desperate to get out doesn't want to go back to Britain. He wants to go home to Spain. So he's trying to avoid uh, getting repatriated or extradited or any, any of that sort of stuff back to uh, England. So he starts doing business with the Cubanos, which were the gang that I just described, who were just a nightmare. And I'd seen other people do business with them. And if it went wrong, you were paying. Even if it got seized by the police or, or even if it didn't get there... Well, nine times out of ten, they probably wouldn't send it anyway, and they just say they had. And I mean, we're not talking little bits. We're talking, you know, 10, 20 kilos of coke at a time, maybe more. So Steve starts doing business, and I said to him, please don't do anything because you're due to get out. His parole papers had gone in. We knew he was getting out because he paid bribes to make sure. And the gang had come up, and they'd said to him, uh, he, he lived like four cells down from me. We were on the same wing for like five years together. See him every day for at least an hour or two, you know, have breakfast, coffee, whatnot. And uh, uh, they've, they've come to him and they've said, look, basically, Steve, if you don't get this money that you now owe us, because he did business, he went wrong, and he ended up owing about 150 grand dollars. And um, they came to him and said, if you haven't paid by this day, we're going to come and kill you. So he was desperately trying to get out of there. I contacted the embassy saying that his life was in danger and they were like, well, well, there's nothing we can really do. We don't really believe you. We think it's you're making it up. We, you know, we know you're desperate to get out, but there's nothing we can do. Rah, 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 we can't move you. And this is the problem. In, in, like I said before, in, the, in these prisons, there's no escape. If you end up in trouble like he did, there's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to run. You can't go to the director. You can't go to the guards. You can't go to your embassy. Because all they do in turn is end up, because not the embassy, but the director of the prison and all the guards are corrupt. So if the embassy complains to the director, he will tell the guards or the gang directly, because quite often he's just in, you know, all of them are paid off. So he'll call up the boss of the gang and say, look, this guy's causing trouble. He's got the embassy involved because that was like a big no-no. If the embassy got involved, it was, it was trouble for the prison and the director. So then the gang would come and shut you up any which way they could. And, uh, yeah. So it was a Monday morning. We've come out at 8, 8.30 in the morning to do the count. Guards come in, done the count, said, morning, Steve, you know, I'll see you on the exercise yard in a bit or whatever. I've gone back to my cell, sat in my room, had me some breakfast. As a, I don't know, about 45 minutes has gone by. There's a bang, bang at the door. And a friend has come and got me and said, look, Steve's not answering the door. We're worried about him. I said, why are you worried? He said, well, we've just seen all the gang up here. And they were coming out of his cell. And now the door's shut. We can't get in. And he's not answering. And we don't know where he is. I was like, oh, fuck. Mm. So I've come out. And above the door uh, to each cell, there was, a, there was a, like a space for an air conditioning unit. Smashed through the wall. And he had an air conditioner in there. So we've pulled the air conditioner out. And sure enough, he's in there. He's hung. And we got in, tried to save him, but it was obvious that he'd been strung up because there was no chair for him to have jumped off. All the chairs were neatly against the side of the cell. He couldn't have gone off his bed. There was a there was a, like an iron ring up in the ceiling, which we, we knew was there. And his head was actually tied, touching the ceiling. Now, when you hang yourself, there's a drop. You're not tied. Do, do you see what I mean? Yeah, that yeah. knot slips. Or, or well, you see, it's, it slips a little bit anyway. So we knew he'd been killed. So they, this is one of their favorite ways of getting rid of people. They would come in, put you in a stranglehold, dear Armando probably, uh, knock you out so you're unconscious, tie you up, string you up, and then you would, you would suffocate. Well, you'd choke, suffocate. So wow. all you know, the guards turned up, and even the guards were saying there's no fucking way this guy's hung himself. He was due to get out. 
We know he hasn't killed himself. He's done nine years. Why would he do it now? Even the guards were going, this is bullshit. There's no fucking way he's hung himself. You know, all the police come in and do the report and we were all saying, look, he's been killed by the gang. We couldn't say too much because obviously, you know. But we notified the embassy what had happened and they were like, no, it's suicide. We, you know, that's it. It's a closed case. So he got epstein Yeah, basically. And two years later, exactly the same thing happened to a Scottish friend of ours. He hadn't done business, but he had got into a fight with a Colombian guy on our wing. Uh, Over what? I I think they were. I I can't. It was something really petty. They were having a drink together or something. Or my mate, his name was Ronnie, wouldn't sell some alcohol to the Colombian. So the Colombians come back and tried to stab Ronnie. Ronnie was a ex-military done years in the military boxer for the army so he's pulled a little knife out and stabbed the Colombian and thrown hot oil over him something like this Colombian gets taken away ends up dead a while later I'm not going to say how but he did anyway and obviously Ronnie was held accountable for that Colombian's death so a little bit of time has gone by. They've managed to get Ronnie moved from our wing where he's relatively safe to another wing where he's isolated from us. And they've apparently how it went down was they, the police were involved. Well, the guards or the police were involved. They came in and said, Oh, you're being uh, repatriated back to Britain because he, he, was, he was trying to get repatriated. They've taken him out of the wing to somewhere else where the gang were waiting for him. And uh, apparently he put up a really good fight. There was about six of them. It took six of them to kill him. And they knifed him, did all the rest of it, and eventually got him down, hung him up. Called it a suicide, but of course, it was obviously it wasn't because he'd been stabbed and beaten this time. They hadn't been as clever. So the embassy now came in and I said, see, I told you Steve had been killed exactly the same fucking way, exactly the similar reasons. What are you going to do about it? And that's when they started repatriating this quickly because they saw that we were getting taken out, basically. <laughs> Let's stop here for a second. Young people, if you're watching this, if this does not put you off wanting to get into the drugs lifestyle, nothing will. Yeah. Do you hear what he said? This guy, that last story was a tough guy, ex-military, a hard man who could fight off six people to a point but ultimately, he got murdered. Yeah. Doesn't matter how hard, doesn't matter what a badass you think you are, these gangs go in like packs of wolves. Yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. And yeah, they yeah. will take you down. Yeah. These are the hard hitting, serious consequences of getting involved in the drugs lifestyle. Yeah. And particularly if you are overseas. Yeah. <laughs> Even buying drugs locally, overseas, just trying to score, they look at you as someone from the West who's got all this money. I've got a story about they that. Can, they I'll can sell you the minute. drugs. <laughs> you go around the corner, cops arrest you. They're working with the cops. Yeah. Next thing, you're on the phone. I'm in a prison in South America and people are getting murdered. Mom, dad, <laughs> yeah. send me hundreds of, you know, tens of thousands right now. I need bail money. Yeah. I need a lawyer. Ooh. Seen it enough times. Yeah, and he's going to tell us a story on this right now. It's, it's all a setup. You could think you could just buy some weed quite innocently. Someone comes up to you on the streets. You are getting set up. It is not worth the risk. Yeah. The worst thing about Steve was uh, two weeks after he got killed, his parole papers came through and he oh, got out. Oh, man. They knew that. That's why they killed him. Man. Sad, isn't it? That is really sad. Yeah. yeah. I, had to, uh, I had to tell his daughters this and explain to them what had actually gone on. Because obviously the NBC said, oh, no, it was suicide. It wasn't. Yeah. Well, suicide is convenient for the authorities because yeah. the paperwork when it's a homicide and all the re you know, the media involvement and all their investigation. Suicide, case closed. Yeah. So my little story about buying drugs abroad. Was, uh, yeah. Uh, one of my friends who is, again, dead now, died of natural causes this time. <laughs> one of uh, only few <laughs> to die naturally. <sighs> <clears throat> his name's Fletch was Fletch anyway Jamie Fletch he was with me in Ecuador actually and uh, we were doing some business and I said to Fletch please don't go out and buy drugs because obviously we're on the down low here we're doing some 
quite heavy business and uh, we don't want any attention from the police or anything going wrong. You know, stay away from drugs, trouble. <laughs> so what does Fletch do? He goes out of the hotel. I'm sat on the on the roof and this was uh, near Avenue Amazonas in, in Quito, where there was a long main road going through the new part of the uh, city. And suddenly I hear all these police guards screaming down Avenue Amazonas. I'm like, oh, please don't let that be Fletch. Just had that feeling. An hour goes by, Fletch hasn't turned up. An hour and a half goes by, Fletch does turn up, covered in blood. <coughs> Literally covered in blood. I said, Fletch, what the fuck have you done? <laughs> you know, I'm checking him to make sure it's not his blood. He says, no, no, it's not my blood. Don't worry. Pulls out a handful of uh, packets of... Oh, no, did he get... No, he didn't get the drugs. <laughs> he tried to buy some drugs. And off, on a, off a guy on a street corner, another dealer seen him doing it, wants the business, and attacks the other dealer... Fletch gets in the middle and tries to stop it and there's this huge knife fight goes on between these two dealers stabbing each other for his custom. <laughs> Luckily, he gets out there after the police turn up, I think, he just manages to fade away into the crowd or whatever and gets back to the hotel. But yeah, so that's uh, yeah, a little story. <laughs> that reminded me of the time when we had 40,000 ecstasy pills come in yeah. from Holland via Mexico and we're in Mexico. Oh yeah. And I told Wild Man to chill. And he buys a ten dollar crack rock off a street dealer. <laughs> the street dealer's ripped him off. He says, Nobody rips me off. Doesn't matter if it's ten dollars or ten thousand, I'm going back. <laughs> and I said, Peter, we've got forty thousand pills coming and you're gonna demolish the sky over a ten dollar crack rock. Are you crazy? <laughs> he goes, I won't do anything to him, just drop me off. So I wasn't pulling in. He uses the momentum of the vehicle to like Ram the guy. Twat this guy's head into a lamppost and knock him out <laughs> right in front of the cop. So I just leave him there. I'm like, fuck, he jumps out to, to savage the guy. Yeah. I just fucking drive off. I'm like, I'm, I've got this operation going. Get back. I tell Wild Woman, Peter just twatted this guy in front of the cops. He's got to be in jail. Go on, someone needs to go and bail him out. Yeah. And then he just shows up like an hour later laughing. <laughs> oh, I know that cop. I mean, with all the cops down here. <laughs> right. Because he's been living down there for a few months. Right, right. Yeah, that helps. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, but people do risk everything, don't they, for stupid, piddly yeah. shit, and that's how people get caught for yeah, big things. Definitely. I knew yeah. a guy uh, years ago when I, when I was dealing in Britain, a Welsh guy, I won't say a name, but I uh, used to sell him a couple of ounces of Coke every now and then. And uh, I said, oh, what, are you, you know, what are you doing with this? Because he didn't look like he was dealing in Britain. And he said, oh, I work in uh, Dubai. I said, oh, yeah. He said, I said, uh, what's that got to do with the Coke? I said, oh, I'll take it out there and sell it there. I said, are you mad? I said, you do realize that they will chop your head off with a really big sword if they get you. I mean, it's the death penalty there. They get out of the scimitar, isn't it, and just behead you for drugs. And he was like, uh, yeah, but it's good money. I said, really? It's that good of money? No. And if you're watching this and you want some wild man Don't stories, <laughs> a good one to start with is English Enforcer in Arizona Prison Part 1. We do have a wild man list with hundreds of videos on it, I do believe. <laughs> All right, so... <clears throat> your mate um been murdered yeah have we jumped ahead to that story was the more that happened before oh that? yeah yeah that was let's, that was, let's, um, let's go back then to where we were yeah so me moving upstairs uh just trying to remember how what went on oh, there's so many years there <laughs> uh i don't know where what's what's, <laughs> what's the question <laughs> All right, so we're telling your story in time order. You've gone upstairs. Yeah. We jumped ahead and told the story of your mate getting murdered. What happened in between you moving upstairs and him getting murdered? Quite, All the major events <laughs> in time order. Um, actually, I suppose it wasn't that long after I moved up there that you got murdered. It was probably... Oh, I was trying to remember. When did all this medical stuff start with you? Because you've not yeah, got into that. Yeah, because that was that was that was up in the wing, the new wing that I moved up into. Describe what happened with all this medical stuff. I mean, that that was a little bit after I think Steve. It, actually, it was around the same time because my mother had died. Steve ended up dead, and then I got TB. This was all in the new wing. Yeah. All right. So, how did you get word that your mum had died? Uh. 
basically she she had suffered a a heart attack um and been taken into i think it was gloucester royal and it was bizarre well i don't know i just, I just get these premonitions and stuff and both me and my sister phoned uh, the flat where her and her partner were living within, I think it was within an hour of it happening. And I hadn't spoken to her in a couple of, well, I don't know, maybe four or five days. And just literally both me and my sister phoned up within an hour of it happening to ask if she was all right because we had a feeling. I know it sounds weird, but it's true. And, you know, that's when I was told that she'd had a heart attack. And she was taken to hospital. They saved her from the heart attack. But because she'd been drinking, she she vomited at some point, went unconscious, and it got into her lungs. Oh, jeez. And um, that was what killed her, ultimately. Some sort of, I don't know, yeah. Her body just shut down over a weekend. So I, I think it took from about Thursday till Monday. So in prison then, you, you can't express your emotions. I remember um, when my girlfriend finished it with me, my second year in, and I was got off the phone crying and I had to like, like, like get on my bunk and just face the wall and pretend to read the books. Oh, no, I was, in, I was in tears. There was no, yeah. there was no stopping me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not shy to cry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Pretty yeah. distraught. You've, you've got this, hor you're surrounded by these horrific conditions where anything could happen at any moment. You get this news then. How, Not, do, you, how do you adapt to that news? Well, it was difficult because, I mean, that was my worst fear, my mother dying in prison or any relative dying in prison. And not only did my mother die, but also my auntie and her son, my cousin, all within about a period of a year. Uh, I got to say goodbye to my auntie on the phone. But I actually never saw my mother again. From the time I left Britain and went on the run, got smuggled out by the Turks. Uh, that was the last time I saw her just prior to that. And not even by WhatsApp, because WhatsApp and all this didn't exist. So I didn't, I never saw her face again. So that was, uh, that was halfway through the sentence. Did you have like photos of her and stuff? in? The yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah, that was the other thing that happened that, <clears throat> Sorry, obviously you've been left with this cough because of TB. So at the halfway mark, all of this happens. My mum dies, Steve ends up dead, auntie dies, cousin, I get TB. And the prison authorities turn around and say, on top of all this, uh, we're only going to give you 11% uh, re uh, like reduction off your, off your 12 year sentence. So I worked it out. I had, it meant I had to do 11 years in a month out of 12 years. So I've now done six. So at that point, they tell me basically that I'm restarting my sentence. And I'd sort of been trying to toe the line, not really dealing too much and stuff in prison. So I turned around to them. I said, well, if you're telling me that, because I said, well, look, if I, if I do some of these courses, or do this or that or the other, will it have any effect on this percentage? And they said, no, that's it. That's the final decision. You now have to do another five years. There's nothing will change it. So I said, right, in that case, you're telling me that even if I'm really bad, it won't affect it. They said, yeah. I said, I'll tell you what, then I'm going to be a fucking nightmare from now on, which is, I wasn't a nightmare. Well, yeah, I was. <laughs> have you got the TB at this point? No, it, it's no. Don't panic. <laughs> okay. It's um. No, I mean you, at this point of the story. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought you meant now. <laughs> have you jumped ahead? Have you jumped beyond getting the TV? <clears throat> um, I, I think I was just. I may have just been starting to come down with it. Tell us how all this health stuff came about, because this is one of the most gripping parts of the yeah, book for so, me. Yeah. So they and it really had me angry and upset. Yeah. So basically, in in the prison, you couldn't get any medical assistance at all unless you paid someone you would have to pay a guard a couple of dollars to take you to the me uh, medical center which was very basic anyway you'd then have to pay the doctor to talk, just to talk to him if you needed any medication you would have to pay for him to write a prescription which you would have to pay a visitor to go and buy from a chemist outside which you would then have to pay a guard to bring in to you so you see, it's nothing for free. Not even, They wouldn't even give you an aspirin or paracetamol for free. I mean, literally nothing. So it was a big thing there. Don't get sick. Keep clean. 
you know, keep healthy because if you do get sick, it's big trouble. And I remember at the beginning of the sentence, everybody saying, if you go beyond three or four years in prison here, you'll be lucky if you get out alive because either you'll get ill, you'll crack mentally, or you're just going to end up dead anyway because it's just so dangerous. And there's me at, already at the six-year point and now looking at another five. And I'm thinking, oh, I can't survive another five years of this. What it's were just, the f- just not going to happen. What were the first symptoms of being ill? Well, like, what happened was they every now and then they would come around doing vaccinations vaccinations and i was all of us westerners were always really skeptical because you know you don't know how clean the needles are are they reusing them you don't know what they're injecting in you is it a vaccine could be anything (coughs) (coughs) so i would well you know most of us would generally say no you know we we refuse to have any injections i don't like needles anyway the best of times (coughs) sorry you're fine <clears throat> so um yeah they come around the the ministry of health ministry de salud and they say we're doing vaccinations for tuberculosis and i was like fuck that because you know us as westerners in britain we've had our our bcgs or whatever you know vaccines for tv i don't need it so i'm on the wing i've bought my cell again you know, I'm with the other foreigners. I don't want to get thrown off the wing. So a whole bunch of them come to me because I'm starting to kick up first now. I'm saying there's no way I'm having this injection done. I'm not just not doing it. So about six or seven of them come to me who are kind of running the wing. and say, look, you're putting us at risk. If you don't have the injection, you could get ill and then that could make us ill. Just bullshit. If you don't have it, we'll throw you off the wing. We'll take your cell and everything in it and throw you off the wing. This was locals or foreigners? So locals. The, the, the Cubanos, part of the gang. The gang. Again. You know, any excuse to fuck with you, basically. So, in the end, a uh, pain of literally almost death, I said, you know what, fuck it, give me the injection. And I tell you what, I regret that every day, literally every hour of my life. They give me this injection and Three months later, I start coming down. I've, well, it might not have even been that. Probably a month after, I suddenly realised that I'm I'm getting really weak. I'm tired all the time. I'm losing weight like crazy. I don't feel hungry. I've got a cough. The phlegm stinks. It's got a very acrid, horrible taste and smell. And I'm ill. I know I'm ill. Like, you know when you know your body, you know something's wrong. And I know I'm ill, and I feel terrible. I mean, I couldn't even walk from here to, you know, past you. So I keep saying to the embassy, something is wrong. I'm sick. I'm sick. I'm sick. And they, I go to the doctor. He says, you've got flu. I say, no, it isn't. I feel absolutely rinsed. Look at me. I've gone from like 80 kilos down to 50 or something. I think the lowest weight I got down to was like 48 kilos. So I halved body weight nearly. Um, and then I started getting all the fevers really high temperatures I remember a Spanish friend of mine who was then living in the cell with me to basically look after me I I, I think I was out for about three days I remember coming around occasionally and he was just like block of ice on my head trying to keep me alive wow so I got misdiagnosed for months and months and months and months and just got iller and iller and iller until eventually they, they said yeah you've got TB and not only have you got TB, you've got multi-drug resistant bovine TB. And I was like, hold on a minute. And then I start thinking, back to the injection. And I start thinking, surely they can't be testing drugs on this. And then all of these boxes and boxes and boxes of cutting edge retroviral drugs, which cost £25,000, not dollars, pounds per patient, for a year's treatment, and you have to have a minimum year treatment. Turn up in the in the in the, in the medical center, and they're dishing them out like smarties. And the maker's mark changes four times in the period I'm sick. I'm on medication for three years. Holy shit! So they injected going, going you back, guys with it as guinea pigs exactly. to test the drugs. So you you think you've got a prison there? It's an enclosed environment, like a town, a small town. There's eight thousand prisoners oh, in there. All on separate wings, quite nicely separated, quite contained. 
suddenly, and I mean, there wasn't a great deal of TB in the prison before they came in with the vaccine. Suddenly, there's different strains of TB popping up on different wings. People dying. Loads of mates died. Tire guy on our wing died. He was in the cell with Ronnie, the Scottish guy that got killed. Some Estonians died with Russians. Just, you know, and I get multi-drug resistant bovine TB. Bovine, that's cows. I haven't seen a cow in six years. <laughs> Apart from Mediavaca, the one I mentioned. <laughs> yeah, half cow. That's the only cow I've seen. Because in- <laughs> you hear about experiments in America from the last century that were done on prisoners and done on black people where they injected them with diseases yeah, just to this, test this, the drugs. This goes so on. now they must take that to the third world, yeah. perhaps. You think how much they're paying the prison system there to, 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 to carry out these tests. I mean, they were talking mega money. And uh, interestingly enough, when COVID started, all you conspiracy theorists out there are going to love this. Oh, we can't talk about it. I'm sorry. Well, hold on. Because it'll get us off YouTube. All right, well, this isn't a theory. This We're about is to fact. take down all of our con- co- right. Corona COVID videos because it's oh no no no, no. It's, it's not to do, well it is vaguely to do with COVID but it's not COVID it's uh, to do with TV okay okay okay, okay okay one of the drugs that they were the, the the Americans were talking about remdesivir yeah apparently isn't patented anywhere or isn't licensed anywhere in the world that was one of the drugs they were testing on us down there because I remember the name and I remember because it was a horrible taste. And I remember the name because it was. I remember the name of the of the of the. Who's the com- who's the companies just putting these drugs out? I can't you know? remember which company it was. I can't remember. People will find out watching this video. But <laughs> when we got transferred out of that prison into the newly built prisons uh, in which the riots have just happened, all our medical records disappeared. Up in smoke, gone. And when we hit the new prisons, there were proper doctors there and stuff, and they were shocked. I mean, yeah, you saw it changed. They were using students from the university, medical students, to help out. And it, things improved drastically. So where you left off then? You had an ice pack on. <laughs> yeah. How bad did things get? Well, I mean, yeah, uh, it, was, it was horrendous. I mean, I was, I was so sick that on multiple occasions, I mean, not just you know, once a week. I mean, like, multiple times every day, I was nearly dying. I couldn't breathe. I wouldn't even be able to stand up. I, the worst was if I fell asleep, because obviously you're, you're so drained because you can't eat and you're the fever and all that. I would wake up, and, but I would wake up choking where my body, the, the, the phlegm has blocked up my uh, capillary, uh, bronchioles. And, I mean, that's how it kills you, basically. It chokes you and, and your lungs turned to to liquid and I wouldn't even be able to shout for help so this is why I had this Spanish guy living with me so I just tap him on the shoulder he'd run and get a friend of mine car another Carlos from from the Dominican Republic who would uh basically come and inject me with um dexamethasone which is uh what kept me alive so I had to keep a syringe on hand ready you know with the dexamethasone in it to to hit me up. What's crazy about this is you survived the slaughterhouse. Yeah. And then no doubt Western companies come in and Try are paying off. people <laughs> off. Paying people off to do human trials yeah. that they can't do in the West. And that and that almost kills you. Yeah. And you're still living with the consequences yeah, of that so to this I've, day. I've got COPD as a result of it. Jesus Christ. Yeah, which, and I had COVID uh, when that first hit Britain in January, not just gone the one before. Yeah. Uh, which I was lucky. I mean, I didn't even know what it was initially. I, again, I started getting fever, vertigo, and then uh, the cough and fever. And um, oh, lost my sense of taste and smell. You don't lose it, everything just tastes horrible. But you only have immunity for six months, so you're yeah. at risk of getting I've had, it. Again I had now. the jab the other day. Oh, did you? Yeah. Okay, okay. Last week, actually, it was about the only good things that happened. <laughs> With the Dexy keeping you alive then, yeah. was there a, like an absolute low point and then your health actually started to improve? It only, it only improved really in the last year uh, really? when I got transferred to that new prison estate where there were new doctors and, and they got it together a bit. And uh, yeah, that's where, that's where I, I've managed to get a bit better. 
So you're in a cell with the Spaniard, you've got this sick condition. Are you thinking, if all hell breaks loose again, I'm just so vulnerable right now? Yeah, I did feel very, very vulnerable. But I mean, because they told me that whatever I did wouldn't matter. You know, I started getting up to all sorts of shenanigans just to survive in there. So you took control of the alcohol business on the wing uh, in, in cahoots with the mafia. So I was the main alcohol supplier for the whole wing. Which is quite volatile because you know when people get drunk and do coke and crack, it's it's trouble. Run so it, I, run it I, down. I was, how you set the operation up? How you make the alcohol and everything? How, uh, how you they they it. they they would well we we when I was actually when I was downstairs in the wing where the first wing that I talked about where there was the gunfire, I started making uh, moonshine, but because we could get fruit and yeast and sugar in there, you could do whatever you wanted basically. So I I got. Uh, big 25 gallon uh, drums from I think they had oil in previously cooking or washed them out properly I started making alcohol from pineapple banana you know high sugar fruits put loads of sugar and yeast in and brewing up sort of wine it was actually really nice it was wine making wine leave it for a month month and a half two months and then sell it Did you have to, in Arizona they, they do it in these bags Plastic bags, they put it against the wall because it's so hot. No, it's the whole, the whole, the whole canisters. I'd like eight of them in the sound. Holy shit. Just pay the guards off. I was working with the gangs. So with the bags, money. you have to burp it so it doesn't yeah, explode. I, to, I was going to ask, do you have to burp <laughs> I, it? Yeah, I had to release the pressure or, or leave it loose so it, so it uh, didn't go. And I remember on one occasion, I forgot. <laughs> 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 this, this canister with, you know, full of all these bananas and uh, sugar. You could hear them hissing at night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this one I forgot to undo. It exploded, blew it, blew the sides of the uh, canister out. Holy shit! And uh, all the gang came running because they thought someone had let a gun off in my room. <laughs> 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 so they all turned up banging on the door. I've opened the door, all covered in banana alcohol. <laughs> so, so the brewery is in your cell. Yeah. Uh, when I moved upstairs, I started carried on doing it, but I, I then also started selling alcohol that they that the gang were making, and they were making it on in a, like an industrial scale with um, uh, what were they? I think it was just sh uh, sugar cane and a few other things in there, and heating it up like to sort of distillery sort of scenarios going on, and making this really strong. Uh, well, what they call puro pure alcohol, basically like sixty percent, seventy percent. Sugar cane, can you? Did it, did it give you the shits? <sighs> no, it gave you, it, it was strong stuff. I mean, you got used to it after a while if you drank it. All right, so once the alcohol is manufactured, what is the distribution process? So they would then come around in uh, like the, the uh, I suppose it was uh, five litre water bottles, canisters. They, they just fill those up and bring, it, bring across like eight of them or something. And I had a big, big hiding space in a false ceiling in myself. So we put them up in there, along with any other naughties. And uh, yeah, just sell it. So um, Cash only or on credit? I would do a bit of credit to some people, cash only. But obviously, there were a few occasions where fights broke out. And I, even when I was sick, ended up, you know, I had a couple of people who act as security and whatnot. But I remember lamping a few people. And the, on one occasion, they hit this Ecuadorian in the face and bent a silver ring around my finger. And I had to have it cut off because I bent it. <laughs> But um, yeah, it was but because I was so you know I lost so much weight. It was it was dangerous. They they ended up calling me Loco Pete, Crazy Pete. Really? Because I'd get into scraps and stuff, and they thought you know bearing in mind how dangerous it was. Yeah, they just thought I was absolutely crazy. But you... I'd sort of lost hope of getting out of there alive. Mm. So when you get to that point and you've seen so much violence, it sort of becomes you sort of I don't know. It's weird. You just sort of become numb to it I don't know what was your scariest conflict during this period of time oh, I was almost definitely that, that gunfight downstairs the gunfight that I nearly got shot in downstairs you know where they, before you got moved upstairs yeah well I'm, I'm asking during the, the sickness oh during the what sickness what was your most serious conflict during the sickness the most most serious what Conf conflict, conflict that you got in during um, the sickness yeah uh, I don't know just fist fights really mainly and uh, yeah, I think. And what's your support from the outside world like at this point? Oh, no, actually, I got hit across the back. Oh, oh that, Yeah, I didn't walk for three months. 
I was trying to split. It wasn't me. I was trying to split two people up, and I was bent over, and somebody came up behind me with a bit of two before whatever and smacked me straight across the back, about midway down. Down, and my my spine's got a kink in it now. <laughs> And uh, I thought they'd broken my back. And uh, I had to be carried to my bed. And I'd lay there for about pretty much for, yeah, two or three months. Jesus. But that was, yeah, that was scary. Did we able to get any medical attention for that? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> thought you broke your back and they don't give you any medical attention. No. Like, have a TB shot. <laughs> yeah. I mean, trying to get out to hospital for TB was, I mean, like, they took me out once when they thought I was actually dying. Mm. I mean, and it was kind of because the gang wanted to get my cell. They, they, they wanted to get me out of the prison for the day so they could rob my cell. So they arranged a hospital trip for me. <laughs> and Thanks, what, guys. What's it like going out of the prison to a hospital? What's that like? Uh, it, if I'd been better, Scenic? I would have, I would have tried to escape. Because they only sent me with one guard because I was that fucked. I couldn't run anywhere. So there was, I, th I think there was one guard, a driver, and somebody from the embassy turned up. Are you handcuffed up like crazy? On that occasion, no, not really, because they, they saw, I, I mean, I was dying. I mean, I couldn't, they virtually they had to get a wheelchair anything. to take me from yeah. the car to the hospital. So. Yeah. And uh, like seeing the outside world, did that bring back memories? I'd never been in Guayaquil. Mm. Gotcha. <laughs> so, <laughs> and you're quite out. No, of it. not really. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't even get to, the opportunity to chat up a nurse or anything? No. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> so we're getting towards then where you must get some good news then at some point about you getting released. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> nothing there's nothing good happens no. in this story it just gets worse and worse yeah pretty much i mean the the only as far as getting released goes i mean the only good news came when i have to backtrack again basically when i got sentenced uh not only was i sentenced to 12 years but there was a, a fine of eight thousand dollars on top but the fine only kicked in oh, it's stupid they, they only sort of applied it if you wanted to get repatriated back to your home country so, I mean, even the government were making money on you. Of course. So, that, so you had to pay the fine if you were getting repatriated before you could get repatriated. And I point blank refused to pay $8,000 to come back to England where I thought I was facing 25 years in prison here, minimum. So I thought, I'm not paying eight grand for the, for, for the pleasure. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So I was trying to long it out and stay in Ecuador, hoping that any minute now I'll be able to bribe my way out, escape, get out, whatever, any way out. But England, obviously time goes on, I'm sick, there's gunfights going on, there's people getting killed left, right and centre, my family are at the wit's end, half my family's died and they just have enough, but, you know, and, and, and say, look, we're going to pay the $80,000 fine. I didn't want them to, I said, please don't, because it made me feel bad, you know, I didn't want them, they've suffered enough already, I, you know. Anyway, they pay the fine. It takes ages for the process to go through. I mean, like I'm talking a year and a half, two years for the repatriation process to go through. Paperwork going back and forth between England and Ecuador. Boom, boom, boom. Julian Assange gets arrested and ends up in the Ecuadorian... No, not arrested. Takes refuge in the oh, Ecuadorian yeah. embassy. Yeah. And I'm joking, going, perhaps they'll do a prisoner swap. <laughs> <laughs> Trade me off with Assange. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. So, uh, yeah, so I, they pay the fine. I get taken from Guayaquil to Quito for a psychological evaluation, which was interesting. And that, on that occasion, they took a lot of heavy machine guns with me because obviously that I tried to escape from Quito. Uh, so they thought, yeah, this guy might try and escape. So I had military you know, bases pretty much accompanied me. Machine gunned up all the way up. So back. we did your escape story in part one, didn't we? That was one of the attempts. One of the attempts. So there's a few. <laughs> so there's a few that you've not described. Yeah, oh, I mean, you want it. You know what it's like when you're in prison. You think about escape every day. <laughs> That's all you think about. <laughs> well, tell the viewers. Well, that and the, women. <laughs> the viewers, the viewers aren't, aren't familiar. Let the viewers know about the other escape attempts you contemplated. Oh, God. There was, I mean, in Quito, there were several... I mean, I mentioned trying to blow the walls of the prison yeah. out with an RPG. We were talking about doing that, the helicopter lift, tunnel. The, that was, the tunnel is what got me moved. Mm. 
Did I, I mentioned when I got to Guayaquil and I was in that wing downstairs where the gunfight happened and I'm watching the news one night <laughs> and a news bulletin comes on. Oh, there's been a tunnel found at Quito prison. Oh, Did I mention it? I can't remember. And that they, they in the process of digging a road out around the, the perimeter of the prison, mm. they'd come across our t- <laughs> and we did, we had actually managed to get out uh, under the wall. We knew we were out under the mm. wall, but we just hadn't come up yet. So, uh, yeah, that was on the news. I, obviously, I, I kept quiet. Didn't mention it to anyone, but I was laughing quietly to myself. <laughs> Do you know like, of any like lone wolf escapes, like Westerners just there, there bribing was... and paying and slipping out in the night? Well, I was, I, was, oddly enough, I was talking to a guy just the other day who... An English guy came into the prison in Quito, a guy called John from Manchester, after I'd been transferred, and he actually managed to escape out of Quito. Did he? He he managed to get over the wall, and they were quite high walls. It was like, you know, sort of 15, 20 foot high wall. Fell. I think he broke his, broke something anyway, but managed to get away. Escaped to Peru, where he tried to do another run, drug run. <laughs> Lessons. Got caught there. Lessons ended learned. up in prison in Peru. Um because I met a guy who'd done the reverse, who'd been in prison in Peru, got out of there, come to Ecuador, tried to do a run out of Ecuador, and ended up in prison with us. And he knew the guy there. That's <laughs> all these crazy stories. So I think John, I don't know whether you're out there now, but I think I think he's free now, apparently. Someone told me the other day. Wow. Finally. Yeah, it was interesting in, in Natalie Welch's, she, a, a guard fell in love with her. Yeah. So that's how she facilitated her escape. I'll let people check the audio book out on the spoiler story. I, I need, yeah, I did a similar, th- vaguely similar thing nearly happened to me over there. In the last prison I was in, the new Supermax was this, uh, uh, an Ecuadorian female guard uh, took a liking to me and uh, named Paula, Paula. And uh, yeah, if I had have been there for longer, I would have tried to maybe do the same or something similar, definitely. Yeah, if you can get some help yeah. from the guards. Yeah. So female guard in that dangerous environment, does the respect of the women carry forward? They're safe, are they? Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, very much so. Was there any... Um, you've talked about a lot about your conflicts with the gang members. Um, did any guards have it in for you? No, I mean, you, you saw, you, you didn't really see a lot of the guys. In Quito, the, um, because I started sort of running the wing with the foreigners up there, I ended up having to bribe the guards every week. They'd turn up on a Sunday and there'd be a row of guards outside myself, like paying them off one after another. Yeah. Like three, five dollars, ten dollars, depending on what rank and who they were. Yeah. Just to turn a blind eye to our activities, basically, and the fact we had phones and, and other stuff. Yeah. So. But not so much in Guayaquil because it was so much more run by the gang there. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't really interact with the with the gang with the uh, guards uh, as much as in Quito. Um, so I remember on one occasion I'd been drinking and uh, been up all night drinking, probably doing some coke or whatever. And the next morning, the count came out drunk, and there was a guard there, but he wasn't in uniform. And he was, he was obviously being quite bossy. And me being drunk, just took him for an inmate. <laughs> Started giving him loads of grief. Ended up nearly having a fist fight with him. And and then everybody got involved saying, you do realise he's a guard? And I was like, no, he isn't. No, he isn't. And he went storming off the wing, got back up, came back. And it was, oh, God, he ended up having to bribe him, pay him like $50 just to, like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I said, "Well, you weren't in uniform. How was I to know you weren't you, you, that you were a guard?" What about the boss of these establishments? Did a warden or a deputy warden ever show up? The director, up? director. They were all corrupt. Not all of them, but the ones that weren't corrupt ended up dead. Two directors got murdered within the time I was uh, shot dead outside the prison for not accommodating the gangs. Yeah, exactly. And did they ever like venture through the wings? Yeah, the directors. I remember did they have a lot of bodyguards. Yeah, they would come in with some members. Well, they they'd have their own bodyguards, but they'd also have some people from the gang would come in as extra backup. <laughs> the directors of the prison have got gang yeah, members yeah. bodyguarding them. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. 
<laughs> so I remember the, this one particular director who was the last director of the, of the old prison before I got moved into the newly built prison, which was the last one that I was in there. I was a bit confused. He came round the wing on one occasion. Uh, well, in fact, he came around on several occasions because he was that corrupt and it was that open that he came around to all the, the bosses of the wings and came to us and said, basically, I want $2,000 a week for you to sell drugs on this wing. I want another $1,000 for alcohol and I want another 500 for the shops and restaurants or whatever. You know, set, set a fee for each thing. I just came around and said, this is what I want from you. If you don't pay me, I'm going to transfer you to the new prison because no one wanted to go there because it was so bad. It was like, you know, super max, terrible. But in the end, everybody just got transferred and he is now in prison himself <laughs> for being so corrupt. <laughs> Did you ever fear getting transferred to the new super max prison? I got transferred. Yeah. They came en masse. Because the prison, the security just had become that bad. They made the mistake of transferring all the heads of the gangs, uh, all the bosses of the gang, to the new prison. They thought that would calm the prison down. But what it did was it destabilized it. And that meant that all these underlings then were vying for power and started killing each other. And it just got more and more dangerous because what they would do, the, the authorities, they would just keep on taking out the boss of the wing. So they'd come in and have a purge and take out all the bosses of each wing. So there'd be like 30 transfers uh, that come back a couple of weeks later, do the same again. So it kept getting weaker and weaker. So then the gang structure fractured and it just became just insecure and really violent. And at that point, the president intervened and said, look, we, you know, there were sometimes two or three murders a day, maybe more. So he said, look, this can't carry on. And they came en masse, military, air force, the Marines, and just took out all of the prisoners. It was December the 1st, 2013 or 14, some other. Coach loads of us to the new prison estate, which they built right next door for this new sort of, gated uh sliding gates on the on the on the doors uh in fact you can show at the end you could we, we could put a video up of the prison uh inside with the police coming in to break up this riot there's no no murders or anything going on there's just the police <laughs> but you it will, it will illustrate what the wings are like um so that i end up getting transferred did you know in advance no so what they about... just turned up this morning. On this morning, so we suddenly spotted police and military on the roof, and we thought, "Oh God!" We knew it was coming. What about moving your property? We couldn't take anything. They literally, I lost all my letters from my mum, oh, all my photos, man. everything. Couldn't take anything. Not a thing. Nothing. They stripped <sighs> us. They put us in a in a, a t shirt, pair of shorts, and flip flops issued by the prison. Chucked us into this new prison that wasn't. Finished, they hadn't finished building it. The water ran one hour a day. So there, was, there wasn't fresh water. They hadn't arranged the kitchens yet. So for the first month and a half, they starved us. There wasn't food on a regular basis. I should have thought this was going to start to improve. No, this is what I'm saying. It got gradually worse and worse. As I went through, normally in a British prison, it gets better and better. And you go lower down in category. There, I went from keto where it was really cushy and I had everything sorted. To ending up in a supermax prison on a wing... The last wing I ended up in was built for 350 people and there were 14 of us in there because they deemed us that high security risk. I was one of them. I ended up on the wing with Cubano, which was the boss of the Cubans. Uh, was the gang named after him? Yeah. And like 10 or, or, or 10 or more of his underlings. And everybody was saying, why the fuck are you in there as well? And out of these you know 10 or 12 other people four of them were the people that had caused me the most trouble <laughs> no! throughout my whole prison term. not the maggot uh no he i think he'd be released by then but the strangler no but two of one of the other bosses because you remember i said there were three bosses replaced yeah. uh the chon when they got moved one of the other bosses was on there one of them was 
And then just, yeah, a couple of other, well, Cubano, obviously he was the boss of all of them. So that's two and then two others. Mm. So when I stuck my head out of the, of the door, the more of the first morning when I was there to see who else was on the wing and I realized what wing I was on and I saw them, I was like, and they saw me, I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> but because of where we'd been put, it was kind of all, all bets cancelled sort of thing. It was like. I couldn't get at you. No, no. Yeah, they could just walked across the yard and said hi. Okay. But it was like all all previous trouble sort of, because I was foreign, it was like yeah, sort of, you know, fresh start. <laughs> all the beefs were squashed. Yeah, kind of. Right. Temporarily. <laughs> perhaps you had a bit of respect because they were thinking they must have classified you quite highly to put you in with them. I never found out why I was there. I, I wasn't there long, about a month. And then I, was, uh, I got moved to the wing next door. All right, so what is a wing like in the Supermax and your cell and everything? Well, you could show people. Yeah, yeah. After. On, on the pictures and the videos. Yeah. I yeah. mean, well, I'll give you a description. It was two concrete bunks, mm -hmm. uh, a metal toilet and a metal sink. Mm. Oh, no, was there a sink in there? Is it the combination sink toilet? With yeah, the, that with sort the, of thing. The ball on the top of the toilet. And then a, a strip light welded into a into the wall basically which yeah. came on at 7 p.m and went off at 10 30 at night you had no control over anything mm. and that was it we weren't allowed pens or paper there were no letters in or out of the prison we weren't allowed books there was no tv there was no radio there were, there were no shaving kits i mean we were giving nothing nothing no newspapers no magazines i mean when i say nothing i mean nothing no canteen no food they would come round I'll give you an illustration of the meals they would come round in the morning breakfast was a bread roll and a, a maybe a hot like colada they called it it was just like um, like uh, corn flour syrup some, something syrupy shit or mm. coffee maybe if you were lucky and a banana once a week oh, it's making me hungry just thinking about it L the lack of food then around midday, they would come around. You would get a bowl of what was supposed to be soup, which is like water, basically, with a bit of bone in, if you're lucky. A plate of rice and maybe one cube of chicken like that. Like that. Just to illustrate. Like this top of my thumb. And then dinner would be the same again. And that would be it. And that went on for about a month and a half until they got the kitchen properly sorted out and, and, and you know, stuff working properly. But even now... I talked to my friends over there, and this is about the same. Maybe, maybe you get two or three lumps of chicken now, <laughs> but nothing much has changed. I mean, you're, they're running it on a budget a shoestring. So, were the gang members able to get the weapons and the drugs flowing again? It took them a little while, um, but they did. Yeah, within about a month and a half, two months. I remember when I turned up on this wing, they had phone blackberries in there because uh, I remember the police raided the wing. On about the third day I, that I was there, came in all armed to the teeth. I yeah, and they were, even they were wondering why I was on that way. <laughs> <clears throat> the only foreigner, gringo. What are you doing here? The God knows. Even in supermax prison, the drugs will flow. It cannot be stopped because yeah. there's so much money in the black market. That's why it should be all be legalized. Yeah, it definitely should be legalized. That's the only way they're going to sort the, all these problems out. So, did you have cellmates then in Supermax? No, not in there. No. So you got your own cell? Yeah. Did that feel a bit more relaxing? Uh, well, I mean, it, it's, no, not really, because this was this was in December, bear in mind. So we're, we're waiting for our Christmas turkey to come from the embassy because we used to get a turkey every Christmas. There was no turkey that year. <laughs> <laughs> turkey was cancelled. Turkey flew off. <laughs> yeah. There were no Christmas presents, no visits. I didn't even hear from my family that year. That was the only year, actually, the, the only only occasion that I ever contemplated suicide was Christmas Eve that year. It was so traumatic that, you know, in a cell with nothing, with no food, we got locked up early. There was no Christmas dinner or nothing like that. And it was, yeah, for about a couple of minutes, that because it's something I would just never do. Did you contemplate the method? There weren't many options. <laughs> it would have been probably, yeah, bed sheets and uh, bars, I guess. Yeah. About the only one. 
So you said all the beefs were squashed. These characters, conflicts must have arisen at some point between I mean, them or when, between when them and you. I or... say the beefs were squashed, but when I saw this one particular, the, the boss from that wing, that it caused me a lot of grief. I, I did, me and him did sit, look at each other and, and say, yeah, the, your day's going to come. I mean, I said to him, you know, bear in mind, I'm going back to Britain, my friend, and I know the boss of the John Arrows, and your name is on my list because, you know, you caused <sighs> my life to be hell for a bit, and you were responsible for some of my friends ending up dead. You know, you wait till I go back to Britain and have funds. And I can send for Hitman for you. <laughs> Trust is coming. <laughs> and all about La Lista. You don't La want to Lista. be on La Lista, do yeah. you? <laughs> That's my La Lista. <laughs> <laughs> so, did anyone make any moves against you? Uh, in there, no, not on that particular wing. Um, I got moved. Something did happen. I can't remember, though. Uh... Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, that many things have happened. I remember something happening, but I can't remember exactly what now. It's just something's ringing in the back of my head. <laughs> perhaps, perhaps it will come back to you. Yeah, maybe another time. <laughs> um, did then? Okay, so how long are you in there for, and where did you move to next? So that was the last prison that I was in. Uh, I spent about a year in there before I got repatriated. Uh, I mean, things got gradually better. I I ended up on a on a wing for foreigners in there after about six months. Took a while to get there, but uh, so that was okay. That was pretty good because all my mates ended up on there as well from the old prisons that I'd been separated from. Well, that must have been gravy after coming out of the hellhole. Yeah, it was quite good. Yeah, but again, the conditions were that bad there, so it's all cancelled. One cancelled the other out. So you always were able to get your hustle on. Were you able to regenerate a little earnings and wealth before you got released? No. No. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> no. No alcohol production or... No. Not yeah. in there. Not in the last prison. Yeah. Um, well, I was saying that, we did start a, something with coke, but yeah, it was just too... I didn't want to ruin the repatriation and stuff like that. I yeah. thought, well, you know, end up getting nicked for something now or end up in a fight and end up killing someone. It's not going to be good. How did you pass your time as things calmed down? Just playing... Oh, uh, I'm... Yeah, I, I was. I'm pretty good at drawing, so I ended up uh, doing portraits for people. Mm. Ended up doing one for the prison director, the new prison director, and uh, yeah, do loads of artwork and stuff. People like to send portraits of the girlfriends and stuff, don't they? Do yeah, they well, know? I mean, it was more I was doing portraits of the inmates to give. While to he their sat there. yeah, <laughs> they didn't come and give all you... these guys coming in sky. <laughs> <out of> my... <laughs> It, <laughs> no one came and gave you a picture of the girlfriend and said, can you do this? Off, uh, a off couple the of them, but I was pretty wary about doing them just in case I didn't do it well enough. Oh, <laughs> man, imagine. <laughs> gave her like a fucking hook nose or something. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, as you're getting close to your release date then, do you know when you're going to get out? No, this is a big problem in Ecuador. The, I mean, that was the main problem. The, there was no release date there. Yeah. If you didn't have money, I mean, I'm talking to friends over there at the moment who, a good friend of mine who's part of the Sinaloa cartel, you mm. know, El Chapo Guzman, it's one of his, uh, one of his capos, mm. uh, called Rigo, Rigo Villa. He is still in prison. He's been there 10 years. He's trying to get out at the moment. And, um, he, yeah, I'm trying to help him as best I can with funds to pay the lawyer, to pay the judge, to pay everyone. Yeah. And if you don't pay, you don't get out, basically. Are you able to speak to Rigo by phone? Yeah, yeah. That was one of the guys I was worried about in the prison uh, massacre. And uh, I got, yeah, I contacted him yesterday. He's okay. So w what was his um, position in Chapo's organization? He was a capo. He was a capo. Yeah. They, they got caught in Ecuador. They were, uh, in fact, the pilot is now dead. You know, I was really good friends with Topo, El Topo, which is the mole. Yeah. He's had songs written about him and stuff. Uh, they would fly into Ecuador in a Cessna, and they had uh, some military paid off in Ecuador who would bring the coke a ton at a time. The Cessna would land on a road. They'd have the road locked off. So Topo would land in his Cessna. They would chuck the bales of coke into, into the back of the Cessna as quick as they could, like a ton. Ton, ton of a bit 
Cessna would spin around, take off. Or from there, probably just take off the same way, I suppose. Long road. Uh, and fly up the, co- you know, up the coast back to Mexico. And then that would be then shipped on up to the States. So they'd be doing this probably once every couple of weeks. And on this occasion, Topo landed, but so did uh, the military turned up and forced the plane down with a helicopter. Helicopter landed on the wingtip of the plane so it couldn't take off. Wow. Yeah. It was on the news over there. So he got, his drugs got jacked by a bigger mafia. Yeah, basically. So, so they all got arrested. Rigo was uh, the capo. So he got, uh, I guess, pretty high sentence. I don't know what he got sentenced to. 14, 16. And what are you trying to do to help him now? Just, you know, I, I send him a little bit of money every now and then for his uh, economy matter, like the canteen, prison canteen, and also his lawyer to try and push papers through to to get his parole, get get him out. So if he like, if, we, if you came back into the podcast and he called you on the phone and you put it on speakerphone, would that get him in trouble? No. Because we could like have a conversation with him on the air and have him tell his story through the phone. Yeah, I'll ask him. Okay, yeah, I'll check ask him out. if he's up there. Oh, but but he, doesn't speak, he doesn't speak English. Oh. Remember. You have less manual. Yeah. <laughs> so you could translate it, though. I could translate it. Yeah. It'll still be interesting, I think. Yeah, 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 yeah. Could do that. Has he got a limit on how long he can stay on the phone? Probably. I'll find out. I'll okay, find out yeah. all this with Yeah, we'll make sure it will absolutely will not get him any trouble at all. Yeah, because yeah, we yeah. do not want to piss off a capo in the Sinaloa cartel. No. <laughs> 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 yeah. Uh, Topo. The, the pilot uh, ended up dead. He, he got shot out of the uh, shot out of the sky by the Colombian military doing a run. Really? He told me some crazy stories about taking off in the jungle. You know those jungle yeah. runways that they have down the side of a mountain with, you know, whatever in the back of the plane. <laughs> and there's Topo flying along. He's, he loved his coke. He yeah. really keep a top pocket full of coke. Topo be <laughs> flying along, <laughs> sniffing coke, turning coke in the back. He's <laughs> a good guy, Topo. And he got shot down. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Honestly, like your story is just one of it's like almost like the Grim Reaper is behind you, man. My a good, a good friend of mine, Mark from Wales. Uh, hi, Mark. You know you are. Uh, you used to call me the Grim Re- Grim Peter, not the Grim Peter. Yeah. Instead of the Grim Reaper, Grim Peter, because of the amount of friend uh, my friends that surrounded have died. by death. Yeah. All my life has been the same way. I've never heard a story of or anyone. By the age of so twenty, I, by the age of twenty, I'd seen eight people die in front of me. Eight people die from drug overdoses, heart attacks, car accidents. I, all through my life, I've just had this trail of death behind me. I don't know why my stepbrother killed himself and his cousin in the same month from November, the same mm. year. I was the last person to see him alive. Just, just all through my life, I've had three girlfriends killed. Well, yeah, accident. I hate to say. <laughs> Jesus. All right, yeah, so... Pretty bad. We're in the part of your story now where you're getting close to your release. Anything notable well, happen? Uh, well, I mean, I get repatriated back to Britain uh, to finish off. Did the last 10 months in Wandsworth where I met, Let, da- where I met David McMillan. Let's do your release. Let's do your repatriation story first. What's the procedure for that? Yeah, yeah. I was going to say that's what, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so the process takes bloody ages to go through. And they finally, one day, they just came to the wing and said, oh, uh, you need to, you're needed up in the offices. And I was like, is it, am I getting, is this the, is this the, you know, is this goodbye? And it was, I got over to the offices and didn't take anything with me. Got there and they said, oh, you're getting repatriated. I was like, wow, really? <laughs> so... Three prison officers, British prison officers, uh, had come out, uh, had flown out to Ecuador to collect me from Wandsworth because they have a dedicated repatriation unit in Wandsworth. So they, uh, yeah, they bring prisoners back from all around the world. Are they armed? No, they weren't. No, just with handcuffs. <laughs> Which is quite a funny story, actually, because because when they arrived in Ecuador, they said that the Ecuadorians started getting out their handcuffs and doing a comparison. Then they get, then they get out all the guns and they said, "Aren't you armed?" And then obviously the British prison officers weren't armed, and the Ecuadorians start getting out their guns and their machine guns and hand grenades and all this stuff. armaments, M16s and whatnot, Glocks. And the British prison officers are just like, "Who the fuck are we transporting?" <laughs> so 
yeah, so for me to be transported to the airport <laughs> was quite a scenario. They turn up Interpol, four Interpol officers armed, handguns, plain, plain clothes. Strip search, blah, blah, blah. Get me out to the car. Front and back, there's a jeep in front, a jeep behind with four armed military in each jeep, all M16 up. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? This is just for me? And they were like, yeah, this is for you. You're all like, you know. I said, why? What's the big deal? And I'm like trying to play it down. I, and I thought, well, maybe it's because I tried to escape from keto. So I start quizzing them. You know, on the way to the airport in the car, the Interpol officers, I'm saying, you know, what's the big deal? What's, the, what, what's with all the guns? They say, oh, don't you like it here? And I say, not, well, yeah, kind of, but not really. I'd be glad to be going home. And they laugh and they say, oh, is that why you tried to escape then? And then the penny job is just like, oh, that's what the security is for. You know, I thought, because I wasn't really sure why I'd been transferred from keto. It took it, you know, it took up until then to confirm that's that was what the reason was behind it all. It was partly me trying to escape and partly because I was up to no good in the prison and whatnot. So they were laughing and joking and saying, oh, you must not like it. You tried to escape from keto, blah, blah, blah get to the airport and they take me through the airport all this military convoy of m16s and you know and it was really surreal at the airport because it, it, you know i hadn't been on the street for nearly a decade and there's all these people wandering around just looking <laughs> at their phones just you know not really noticing that there's me being shuffled through <laughs> surrounded by <laughs> men, armed police and people were bumping into us and looking up and going <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, there was quite a big uh, sending off party. Human rights lot were there at the end. <laughs> Never saw them all the way through the sentence. <laughs> but they were there at the end just to make sure I wasn't getting abused. And were you able to take your final belongings with you? Or were they all left behind as well? Um, no, I, I, yeah, I didn't get to take anything with me, I don't wow. think. I guess there's like a sense of I've lost everything at some point. I've got to be just completely detached from material possessions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's quite a good experience. It's liberating, extent. isn't it? It is. But I mean, the the, what, the only thing I, that ever pissed me off was losing the letters from my mother yeah. and photos because they were irreplaceable. Mm. And they went and there was nothing I could do about it. I mean, that was the most upsetting. I didn't care about all the TVs and all the clothes and yeah, everything else that I lost. Yeah. So what? That can be replaced. Yeah, yeah. Things, you know, letters from my damn mum can't be. Mm -hmm. And how long is the flight then? It's quite a long flight. We had to stop in Barcelona. I did think about escaping. <laughs> I was thinking about going in Barcelona. Just to it, avoid the ones with... Yeah, because well, cause I, th I, I thought I was going to be resentenced when I got back to Britain. I thought when I landed in Britain, I was going to be met with loads of police and, and face going to trial and getting resentenced to 25 years in Britain for the 80 odd kilos uh, conspiracy charge that was waiting for me here. Um, but that didn't happen. I mean, I, ha I had been told um, after about two or three years in Ecuador that the British judge had said that he was, uh, would accept that, I, you know, that I'd been sentenced in Ecuador as long as I did a minimum of six years in Ecuador. Um, uh, yeah, what was it? As long as I did a minimum of six years in prison, that I wouldn't be resentenced in Britain. But I ended up doing ten years and ten days in total. So never knowing when you're going to get out, that uncertainty, thinking you're oh, going to come back terrible. to the UK and, yeah. and they're going to bang twenty five on you, that must have been constantly it was, going it was. through your head up until the day I actually walked out of Wandsworth, and then I knew, yeah, that was it, done. And even then, on my release day at Wandsworth, because obviously we get a piece of paper there with a the date on, you know when you're getting out. The, the day came, all day it went by, and they're not letting me out. And I keep going to the SO or PO or whatever it was. Going, said, what's going on? I'm supposed to be out. Oh, uh, you know, just keep mugging you off, going, oh, it'll be later, 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 later. Comes to the point of which later never came, and I'm like, Fuck this, I'll get on the phone and ring my family, ring the, prob the probation officer that I'm supposed to be meeting that day. I said, look, I'm not going to make it. They're not releasing me. You, you know, 
ring my solicitor or ring someone. <laughs> so six o'clock comes and they come and get me in uh, and release me out of Wandsworth at like 6 p.m. Yeah, I had a little panic at the end. I had like a thing called a half-time release on the balance of my sentence that hadn't been processed. It wasn't showing up on the computer. Right. So I didn't get out on my release day even. I'm thinking, uh, if that doesn't go through, I've got another two and a half years or something. Oh, um, but they let me out a couple of days later. Yeah. yeah but I was shit. It's nerve-wracking. I was it's horrible. Absolutely. Those final days are the worst. In yeah. any sense, it's the last days are the worst. Going in and coming out like the stress is yeah. off the scale, yeah, yeah, totally. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, you're in Barcelona. You're oh, yeah. con contemplating escaping. Yeah, yeah. I was gonna. Do you know what I was gonna do? I was gonna drug the the prison officers on the way back on the plane. I was saving up pills that, that I was getting <laughs> off inmates. I was actually doing it. I was saving up pills and stashing them. I was gonna plug it and uh, drug their drinks on the plane, and then get off the plane and do one because yeah. I knew we. I knew we had to stop even Barcelona or or. I know it might be Madrid, sorry. I think it was Barcelona we went through. So, we, yeah, we, 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 yeah, we were either going to go through Spain or Holland because that was the route into Britain. There's no direct flights from Ecuador. So, yeah, I was going to try and drug them and then get out of the airport. And how long did you spend in that airport? Uh, it was just whilst we changed planes. It was um, maybe an hour or two. So, so like, like, I'm used to, like, prison um, transportation and Connor and all that shit. How about like getting a have it taking a pee and things like that? They got to watch you pissing because I yeah, have to watch yeah, me yeah. pissing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I remember at, at the airport in Spain that I mean the, the the prison officers were the British ones were okay with me on the plane back. We had the entire two back rows of the plane, so we had one sat either side of me all the time and then one behind me for the whole flight back, and they were rotating because it's like a fourteen hour flight. Bit total. And then to take a piss, what what was the procedure? Yeah, they would. Uh, what on the plane? Just whenever you wanted to go. Uh, they, well, yeah, they would come with me. They, I think, they would cuff me to them, take me to the toilet, and either have to watch me or, or on the plane. I think they just, yeah, I think I had to leave the door open, but go in. But so you just get kind of get used to. Um, I don't mean to be crude, but you kind of get used to staff stirring at your privates because of all of the strip searches, don't you? I was, I was telling my girlfriend about something the other day. Yeah. When I got transferred from Quito to Guayaquil, uh, on the transfer down, I was handcuffed like, arm in arm with a Dutch guy and we stopped halfway down for a piss and they got us off the bus and we're, like me and the Dutch guy are into, into linked arms and they, and, I said, and they said, well, can you open us up so we can have a piss? And they said, no, you'll have to do it handcuffed to your mate. It wasn't really a mate. I mean, yeah, yeah. It's Kevin from Holland. Yeah, no pressure to pee here, guys. So true. Yeah, exactly. And it's like it's the last thing you want when you're trying. You to hang up to your mate, it? and guards are staring at your yeah. dick oh. to make sure oh. you're like not doing anything weird or getting drugs out your asshole. Yeah, <laughs> or oh, knives. Because <laughs> <laughs> you got people like they get called out for pee tests, uh. and then. The stone at your dick to make sure this happens in Arizona that you're not yeah, going to get out yeah, fake yeah, pee yeah, and a got fake a bag of piss, bag of piss, or whatever container. And then if you can't piss under those conditions, you get a dirty. Yeah, you, and you lose your visits yeah, and you come yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> These are the things you have to go through if you think you're a big bad gangster. <laughs> you're going to end up with guys staring at you trying to piss <laughs> yeah. for years on end. Yep. Strip searches coming in and out of visits in England. This is yeah. I remember the strip searches because I was potential category A. Fucking hell, they would go to town on me every time I'm in and out of the visit. Just yeah, coming. They they would come into my cell at, uh, once every couple of days, just to completely trash the cell. All your photos on the floor, trample all over it, rip your radio apart so it, to the point it didn't work. I remember female officers coming in and strip searching me at Gloucester Prison, and that's they're not supposed to do that. And uh, they were coming to it at a time, door behind, like half shut, and make me strip, like just to harass you, de you know, dehumanize you, fuck with your head and all that sort of shit. I was lucky because I was in Arizona prison after they had ruled the strip search known as the finger wave unconstitutional. Which is? You're in a cubicle with a guard. Guard puts on the rubber gloves and sticks his finger in your cavity. Oh, God, yeah, yeah. They used to do that in Britain, yeah. didn't they? Did they? Yeah, yeah. Well, the police used to have powers to do that in Britain. Wow. Police search. Uh, yeah. Wow. I've Could, never had that done in Britain. Thank that fuck. that got ruled unconstitutional because surprise, surprise, it led to people getting raped and all this other stuff. 
Yeah. Yeah. So what was the stri- what's the strip search like in Wandsworth then? Oh, I can't remember. It's just standard strip search. I mean, I usually like you said, you just get used to it. Didn't you? Yeah. So it's just like <laughs> where we were at. It was like you got to get naked, um, turn around, bend over, spread your buttocks wide open, and cough, and they're looking yeah. looking right yeah. in to see if there's similar, anything. Similar. Yeah, that seems to be the the norm. Check so, you check your hair behind your ears, in your mouth, under your tongue. Yeah, check your mouth, armpits, ears. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, lift yeah. you. Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They had they actually had a thing where you had to pull your foreskin back in America and do a foreskin. Oh, search. I've had that in English prison. In in English, yeah, I've had that in England. Did you? Yeah, police in Britain. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's pretty grim. Yeah, don't get gangsteritis, young people. These are the things that you don't anticipate. That you just. Yeah, I the forgot guy's that. telling you pull your foreskin back. I'd forgotten that one actually. And I was like, what? I had no yeah. idea about this. If I had, when I started out with drugs, if I could see, I was going to end up with a in a room with a <laughs> big redneck prison guard saying, "Pull your foreskin back." <laughs> yeah. I might have thought twice about this. <laughs> These are the things that you're going to end up having to do. All your freedoms are gone. Yeah, your body is owned by the state. Yeah, Her, Ma- Her Majesty's pleasure, HMP. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ple- pleasure in the Queen. Yeah, and that's how you're doing it. So, <laughs> did Wandsworth seem quite? Easy oh, for Wandsworth you. was like a holiday camp to me. Yeah, <laughs> I was so happy to be in Wandsworth. Mm. I got there. I remember the, on the second day out on the exercise yard, wandering around, there was some guy wandering around and crying, going, "Oh my God, Wandsworth's so bad. It's terrible. I can't handle it. I'm gonna kill myself." I was laughing. Yeah, I said, "You're, <laughs> you've got to be joking." I said, "I, I, I didn't even bother explaining, but I was just like, yeah, I can't be bothered to explain, but like, <laughs> just, just shut the fuck up." Did, really. did the prisoners know your history? No, I mean, there was because of a few other people that had been repatriated, uh, David included. Uh, that's where I met David, who was in Wonder. Uh, David McMillan, this is. Who's going to be here any minute, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I could talk to them. And there was there was another English guy that had come back from Peru, actually, uh, from Oxford. I can't remember his name now. but uh, So I found him, and we could talk to each other about the experiences. That, you could it relate. Was just, yeah, it's just trying to explain to people on in an English prison what it was like. It's just, you know, unless they were actually sort of half sensible and they're actually interested and could understand and could comprehend. Otherwise, it was like, what's the point? Yeah. I was just happy to have running water, food three times a day, which was pretty substantial in a British prison, or even maybe more. And you could get stuff from the canteen and you could eat well. And you had a TV and it was in English. And the light you could turn on yourself and you could go out and have exercise and not get shot or stabbed. And just the fact that I wasn't going to get killed or end up dead was just nice. Did you find then that your adrenaline had just been going full tilt? Yeah. And then in Wandsworth, you started to settle yeah, a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just slept for about a week. Did you? <laughs> yeah. And how long then was your total Wandsworth stint? T- one thing that I found really, I don't know whether you got, you probably didn't get this, but coming back to Wandsworth, I didn't think I'd get that uh, culture shock, mm. but I got it massively. I thought, you know, because I'm coming back to my own culture, I'm coming back to England, back to what I know, I'd be okay, but, but not at all. Came back and it was, uh, uh, when did I, I think it was November I got transferred in. So it was just prior to Christmas and all the advertising was on TV, and so I was just being bombarded by adverts and full on Western con- consumerism, uh, consumerism and capitalism. And just seeing all the food wastage in, in Wandsworth, like half buckets of rice getting thrown in the bin and loads of wrapping. And whereas in Ecuador, every last thing gets used, every little last bit of food gets eaten. There's always someone that's hungry or someone will eat it, or, you know, whatever it is, even down to the bones. And I mean, it's everything. <laughs> Excesses of the West. Just can't explain that like, yeah. everything gets used and there is yeah. no excess packaging. It just doesn't happen. So seeing all this, it was quite disturbing and I, it was actually quite upsetting and, and very difficult to comprehend. And also the seasons, I still have not adjusted to the days getting lighter and darker because in Ecuador, you're on the equator. It's 12 hours light, 12 hours dark, day in, day out, all year round. Yet here... Suddenly, it's getting lighter and darker and hot and colder, and just 
Yeah. Messes, messes Look at me where I'm dressed. I still find it weird. Messes with your head. Yeah. Yeah, I was out of the country for 17 years. So coming back, I didn't, wow. I didn't do... How long um, did you do it over there? I did so six, but I didn't transfer. Right. So I just got straight deported. Right. Okay. And then I was just like, my mum and dad and my sister were at the airport and um, they took me for Indian food right away. Yeah. But because of the stuff that I had, that occasionally had dead rats in it and stuff, I couldn't eat it. Oof. Yeah. So we just got... Um, Vegetarian options. I stay. With. I try. Okay. I, I I converted to the Hindu religion to get the vegetarian diet in right, yeah, yeah. system where I was at. Um, <laughs> but yeah, adapting then, it was a trip. Like you see, like the wealth of the country from when I'd left. Yeah, houses that my parents the street no longer had like a little car outside. They had like two or three cars outside. Yeah, and all the kids yeah. are going around with. Self, yeah, the whole society had changed, didn't it? The yeah, same for me so when I came much. out the whole society because you, you had all, like you say, all the cell phones, the everything. Yeah, you, you, suddenly all the pubs had closed. Yeah, everybody was on Facebook and, and WhatsApp. And mm -hmm. when my sister first told me about WhatsApp, yeah, yeah, I was like, No, surely you mean what's up? <laughs> you spell it wrong. <laughs> she was like, No, it's what's, what's up. up? Homie? I said, What's, what's up, up? Homie? And she said, yeah, Exactly, yeah, what's yeah, up? Yeah, and I was yeah. like, I just couldn't get it. I was like, What are you talking about? <laughs> Did your family, your remaining family, visit you while you were in Wandsworth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was the yeah, nice. that was an emotion when they first yeah. came in and I saw my dad. I mean, again, I hadn't actually seen him on camera or physically yeah. at all for 10 years. So he had aged markedly, you know. Right. And, his, you know, it was, yeah, it was, it was, my sister had a kid, mm -hmm. got married. Um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, yeah, a big shock. Wow, Peter. So we're at two minutes in. We're going to round up. Two this. hours. Two, two hours. Two, <laughs> two seconds. Hold on. This. Let's start again. <laughs> wow, Peter. So we're at two hours in. Yeah. Part two. Again, just absolutely mind-blowing. The absolute depths of horror, depravity, medical experimentation. <laughs> Finally, you know, coming home and thinking you're going to get 25 years on top of that so you never actually knew when you were going to get out which yeah not until the day i walked out of wonder the mind fuck the uncertainty of not knowing when you get out is is horrendous and then you end up in wandsworth and you bumped into a guy who's been in trouble in afghanistan banistan apparently all over the world um yeah david <laughs> oh here he is. Oh, here he is. Oh, David. Uh, somebody How are you? Oh, How are you? <laughs> somebody gave me this address. I didn't realize it. Oh, is it? Uh, It'll be a long later. <laughs> That's Joe. That's Joe. That's James. Well, I'm telling you, I'm on twice what the bananas wanted before. So, yeah. At least you still got your head. It's, it's fresh, really. really fresh. There's the bananas. Banana man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, actually, you just saw that shipment that just came into Tottenham the other day, didn't you? That was in bananas. Oh, was that it? That was from Colombia. That I'm wow. not saying that was my mate, but yeah, <laughs> not yeah. far off. <laughs> no, but the, the, um, the other ones that had some guavas and uh, the what's that other one? Uh, the mango. Oh, yeah, we'll love a mango. Some of that. Papaya, Waitrose, maybe. Waitrose mango fingers. It was in some of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, they weren't all done. It was in some of them were uh, rubber and, and plastic. But that's the ones we were doing. Rubber. <laughs> Could you have your picture taken? <laughs> This is PPE, I, David. I what you want to <laughs> Protective. Yeah, yeah. Just wait till you see my uh, coronavirus mask. I thought it was something you're not mask. telling me. Now. Where's my coronavirus mask? Yeah. What else have you got in your bag? <laughs> the government said. Okay, here we go. The government said we have to wear a mask. People, yeah. this is, people are quite boring. He is the joke. Everybody's wearing. <laughs> if everybody would step up and wear a really interesting mask. Oh, the whole boy. world would be like carnival time. <laughs> Everyone's depressed and gloomy <laughs> with the little blue thing on, the little surgical blue thing. This is Sean's version of the mask. Boris Brecher, famous rave DJ. He oh, yeah. Has it. Yeah. That's yeah, Boris Brecher's yeah. mask, is it? Boris Brecher's mask, yeah. I had to have it imported from Europe. 
That's cool. And the reason I'm wearing it is, and I've been doing a few, dropping a few photos in it, is because there's these conspiracy theories going out now saying, because I can report on Epstein and not get deplatformed, I am working for the Illuminati. <laughs> so, yes, as you can see, I, I'm feeding into that conspiracy theory. You know, there's a ceremony you've got to go through <laughs> to become a fully fledged member. I don't know if you want that to go to it. We're going to get to that in part three, which is coming up in the channel within weeks, I imagine, at the rate <laughs> these things are going these days. So please join us for part three with Peter, with David, and Oops. for David, it's, for David, it's part what, 10, 11, 10, 11. 11. In the description box are the links for Peter's part one. David's playlist of many, 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 many videos, hours and hours of that relaxing voice. Well, or what to do before you decide to end it all. <laughs> By part 11, you seriously would want to do that. <laughs> and huge thank you to Joe and James for sitting here and enduring these tales and watching my insanity um, wearing this mask today. I really appreciate that. Anything, anything else you guys would like to say in conclusion? Uh, no. <laughs> <you've been> <laughs> <Voila! I'm> sorry, <laughs> yeah, come back when we be. No, yeah. It'll help a lot. Alright, fist fist bump then with the protective glove. <laughs> no uh, three bump, fist bump. Vamos, trema, 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 trema. Venga, flecha, flecha, flecha. Ingresa, ingresa, ingresa. Dale para acá. Vete, escudo, vete, escudo, escudo, escudo. Escudo, escudo, escudo. Escudo, escudo. Escudo, escudo. Arriba. Arriba. Al piso, hijo de puta, al piso, al piso. Suelta eso, al piso. Fatales, liderada por Adolfo Giovanni Chávez Moreira, alias Adolfito. Se dedican a cometer delitos de sicariato para la organización de los choneros. Banda La Marca, liderada por Junior Alexander Roldán Paredes, alias Junior, cometen varios delitos en apoyo a los choneros. Banda Los Pangora, liderada por Jorge Alberto Montoya Morán, alias Pangora, brazo armado y ejecutor de sicariatos de los choneros. Banda Los Lagartos, liderada por Carlos Mantilla Ceballos, alias Choclo. Mantienen el control del pabellón 5 y cometen delitos dentro y fuera del centro. Banda Los Lobos, 
fue brazo armado de choneros hasta la muerte de Rasquiña, liderada por Wilmer Chavarría Barré, alias Pipo, control del pabellón 6 y 9 de la penitenciaría, actualmente con prelibertad. Banda Tiguerones, liderada por William Joffre Bautista Alcíbar, alias Negro Willy, fue brazo armado de los choneros y mantienen el control del pabellón. ...y mantienen el control del pabellón 8. Banda Chone Killer, liderada por Antonio Camacho Pacheco, alias Benjamín... ...brazo armado de choneros, tráfico ilícito de sustancias y sicariato... ...y el control del pabellón 2. En el Centro de Privación de Libertad Femenino también existen otras bandas... ...como la organización delictiva Pepe, liderada por Sugei Magdalena Gómez Cervantes, alias Pepe... ...quien mantiene el control del pabellón C... Organización delictiva Junior, liderada por Junior Alexander Roldán Paredes, alias Junior, se mantiene el control de talleres. Y la banda Los Gorras, liderada por Carlos Mantilla Ceballos, alias Choclo, quien mantiene el control del pabellón A.